High Adventure. Tonight, Ron Evans gives us a special Christmas adventure in his story, A Firing Squad for Christmas. Come in, Miss Webster. Tucker said you had an urgent matter you wish to talk over with me. Yes, hmm? Mr. Aldridge. Um, it's the beginning of December now, yes. and I've got a lovely idea for a Christmas series of articles. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, sit down and tell me all about it. That's what I like to see, initiative from our junior reporters. I'd like to go to France, uh, sir. Well, we'll visit the men in the trenches and let the people at home know oh. how they're spending Christmas. Really, Miss Webster, the idea is preposterous. A woman can't go up the front line. The war office would never permit it. In fact, not even a mail correspondent would be permitted. Elverson is over there now, and the closest he can get is a village called Outil. No, 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 no. Take my advice, Miss Webster. Uh, stick to the more genteel type of reporting. Uh, wedding, society, and the like. The front line is strictly for men, my dear. You don't quite understand, sir. I've made up my mind. Then unmake it. Well, if you won't send me as an official correspondent... Then I shall go as a freelance. I'm sure the Globe, the Herald, and the Mail won't reject my reports. Uh, I see. So you're giving me an ultimatum. Hmm? If that's how you wish to take it, yes, sir. I'm going to see what it's like at the front line. And nothing, and nobody's going to stop me. Miss Kathy Webster was a pretty young thing of 22. She'd been with my paper for three years, and never, not once, had she ever shown the dogged determination she displayed at that interview in my office. I was shocked by her plan and equally shocked by her sheer stubbornness. There was something more to it than met the eye. Of that, I was fairly certain. There are nearly a quarter of a million men there fighting in the rain and mud, Mr. Aldred. That's a quarter of a million families who want to know how their menfolk are spending the festive season. Well, well, think of what it could do for our circulation. Oh, are you really concerned for the paper's circulation? Well, it's what pays my salary, uh, sir. Not for much longer, if you persist with this harebrained scheme. I am going. If you refuse to help me, then you must accept my immediate resignation. No. What is behind all this, Miss Webster? You can't be wanting to do this to boost circulation or to satisfy a morbid curiosity. And most certainly not to elevate your status in the journalistic profession. No, 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 no. Tell me the truth. What is the driving factor? I, uh, hmm? I want to do it because it hasn't been done before. Uh, do I detect a blush, Miss Webster? Ah, yes, yes. Most difficult to disguise. I would suggest that there is a gentleman involved. Are you barking up the wrong tree? Uh, let me see. Uh, yes, uh, could it be Paul Harrison? He was paying you a lot of attention before he volunteered for the army. Um, he's a captain at the front now, so I'm told. Uh, probably you know better than I, my dear. <laughs> Well? I'd like to see Paul, certainly. He mm. writes to me on occasion. And you're determined to see him for Christmas, eh? Yeah? Well, if he's around while I'm there, why not? I shan't make a special point of looking for him. Uh, I know a simple newspaper editor can have a devil of a job separating a woman from her chosen man, but about a war, that, that's a different matter. No, 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 you'll you be wasting your time and money and gather a lot of hardship and heartache in the process. I'll find a way, Mr. Aldred. Even if I have to cut my hair and wear a uniform. I see. Then there's no stopping you. Very well, I should hate to lose a valued employee like yourself. So, you can go on your own initiative and at your own expense. My paper will in no way be responsible for you, and your salary will cease until the day you report back here for duty. You will be a freelance in every way but one. What is that? I shall use the material you send back and bank your fees, which will be paid at top freelance rates. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, yes, yes, there is one more condition, though. Yes. You must send no reports to other newspapers. Well, is that a deal? Better than I ever hoped for. If it wasn't for your secretary's nasty mind, I'd give you a big kiss. Oh, really, Miss Webster, you're getting out of line already. It was December 1914, and the First World War was in its very early stages. 
The fighting between the French and British on one hand and the German invaders on the other had been bogged down to a dreary series of attack and counterattack from one line of muddy trenches to the next. At that time, it was still possible for a British civilian to cross the English Channel and travel to Paris without a pocket full of military visas. But travel east of Paris was taboo to any foreigner excepting extraordinary circumstances. As a result, on the 18th of December, Cathy found herself stuck in Paris. From there, she sent me a report on the petty officiousness of the French and the high-handed officiousness of the British. I published it and drew a storm of controversy, and circulation was boosted by 10,000 copies. After exhausting all the official channels to get a visa, Cathy took to less conventional means to meet her end. She visited a number of underground drinking parlours in the French capital. You know, miss, I can't believe you're English. You been here long? A week. I've been here a couple of months. On business? Uh, yeah, sort of. I know you bought me this drink, and I know you're going to think it very rude of me when I call you a liar, Mr. Wickens. Hey, what's that? I've been watching you very closely. The girls in the bar eye you with, well, a mixture of respect and fear. You run them, don't you? Oh, oh yes, well, that's very perceptive of you, miss. You like to join our happy little group? be quite a novelty having an English girl. You can drop that idea this instant, Mr. Wickens. I'm here on genuine business. Well, what other kind of business could a pretty girl like yourself be doing in a place like this? You're an army deserter, aren't you? How do you know? I'm, I mean, what gives you that idea? Female intuition. Desertion is a capital offence, you know. Firing squad and all that. Yeah, what are you getting at? I want your cooperation. And I can make it financially worth your while. I need a loosely fitting army uniform. Royal Artillery, 10th Brigade. Can you get it for me? For five pounds. Ten? Ten only, if you get it for me by nine tomorrow morning. Well, it's going to be a rare old job. But I've got me contacts. All right, nine o'clock sharp. And another ten pounds, if you can get me a fully stamped military visa that will take me to the front. I want it to appear that I'm returning to my battery from a weekend's leave in Paris. Blimey, it's for you. It makes no difference to you, does it? Well, is it possible? Oh, pass is easier than the uniform. What name do you want, honey? John Francis. Uh, hang on. I'll use my own surname, Webster. Gunner John Francis Webster. I'm staying at a pension in Rue de Mail, Hotel Etranger. Got it. Now I'm prompt. Uh, how about an advance? Cash on delivery, Mr. Wickens. Just like your girls. The army deserter Wickens was as good as his word. The uniform fitted her well and succeeded in disguising the more prominent features of her feminine figure. Kathy paid her hotel bill, and with the uniform and a paper parcel under her arm, she went to a second-hand shop and bought a bicycle. She rode westward out of Paris, then turned south. On a lonely country road, she changed into the uniform and buried her own clothes. Whistling in a most unladylike manner, she cycled eastwards toward the village of Autil. She was sure that there she would be able to find the location of Paul Harrison's battery. It was now the night of the 19th of December, and there were still six days left to Christmas. As it happened, when she arrived in the village of Otil, affairs were in a state of chaos. Nobody spared her a second glance, and her questions, asked with a deep, husky voice, went unanswered. British and French troops were marching through to the front, buttons and weapons shining. On the other side of the village came a tattered array of British and French troops returning from the front, muddy, wounded, and totally disillusioned about the glories of war and blind patriotism. Cathy successfully passed two French and one British checkpoint and continued her journey eastward. Already she could hear the sound of the big guns and see flashes of light on the darkening horizon ahead. Suddenly a shell exploded in the road about a hundred meters ahead of her and the blast threw her from the bicycle. It was now dark. To her right she could see the charred ruins of a farmhouse. Hiding her bicycle in the ditch, she hurried across to it to take shelter for the night. Now, who's stay over there? Answer me, I'll blow your ruddy head off. Look, I can see you. 
Gunner John Webster. Where from? 10th Brigade, Royal Artillery. Oh, fancy that. Same here. You get lost as well? Uh, yes, yes, we were ambushed. Sure, well, come in, come in, come in. Isn't healthy close to the door like that? You know, shrapnel. Would it range the jerry big guns from here? I'm Eddie Thatcher. Who's mopping you with? Captain Harrison's. Oh, yeah, I was with old Blood and Guts Bates. <laughs> he got Blood and Guts all right. He got himself blown into the top of a ruddy tree, he did. Only his boots left on the ground. His feet still in them. All right, what are your plans, Johnny? Going to stay lying low, or are you going to go back and get yourself blown up? I, I don't know. Well, I say we stay here for a while. There's chickens and eggs in the barn outside, and I found a big dollar by that French cheese. Stinks to high heaven, but doesn't they taste bad? Have some. No, thanks. You sound a bit poised, don't you? Where are you from? London. Same here. Where did I put that bleeding candle? I dust it when I heard you crossing the cobblestones. Yeah, I got it here. Yeah, that's better. Now I can get a good butcher's at you. Cool, you're only a youngster, eh? Your voice still squeaky. Not even broken proper yet. You look more like a drummer boy than a ruddy gunner. Now, Johnny, where are you going? To find a quiet corner to sleep. I'm awfully tired. Don't worry about it. It's all fixed up. Found a couple of tarpaulins and a load of straw in the barn. Make a nice, comfortable bed. We can share it's it. It's all right. I, I'll fix the place for myself. That's all right. I can see what you're thinking. Well, let me tell you something, Sonny. Oh, no! I tripped over that stone. Oh, you did, did you? Yeah. Isn't that funny? What, what do you mean? <laughs> you can't fool me. Take that tin helmet off. I will not. Take it off before I make you take your pants off as well. Well, you wouldn't dare. I'm a big fella, as you can see. Do you do it or shall I? <laughs> so I was right. There's no ruddy soldier in the whole British army with a fancy haircut like that. Now tell me something, darling. What's a pretty girl like you doing up here at the front? Gunner Thatcher was a big man, and his seemingly rough manners gave her cause for concern. Cathy decided it best to tell the truth, and did so. He sat on a bench and listened without comment. When she finished, Cathy waited pensively for his reaction. She was now totally at his mercy. He chuckled. <laughs> You're quite a girl, eh? So, is this Captain Harrison you've come all the way to see? A mixture of business and pleasure. I'll continue to write in my reports. Oh, oh, pleasure, she says. There's no pleasure here at the front, my pretty young miss. More like you get a German show blowing your head off. Yeah, Captain Harrison, eh? Yeah, I heard of him, yeah. I think he's down, uh, he's down Maru way. Is it far? Ooh, about 50 miles south of here. Well, if I was you, I'd hang on a day or two. There's a story going round that his battery's moving out this way. I can't very well stay here, can I? Oh, well, it's as good a place as you'll find in these parts. Can't go much further forward or you'll be in the trenches. Well, I've got the uniform. I can continue pretending I'm a man. <laughs> in the ruddy trenches? <laughs> they'll find you in two hours flat, I'll tell you. Look, can you imagine what they'll do to you finding a pretty young thing up there, eh? A great batch of men who've been shelled and machine gunned for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> Oh, me, I shudder to think. Now, look, you stay where you're safe from everything except a direct hit from a jerry shell. The burly gunner made her a comfortable bed, and they spent several hours talking before she fell asleep. That night, she gleaned enough information to write at least three more reports. The problem was going to be sending them back to Paris and avoid the usual military censorship. Although she was not going to give away any secrets... She was critical of many things the military would not approve of. She awoke next morning, and he gave her some tea in a tin mug. Hello, hello, hello. What's going on here? Oh, blimey, Mr. Sergeant. Having a ruddy picnic, are we? So this is where you've been hiding, eh, Thatcher? I was ready to book you down as dead, missing or deserted. And who's your friend? Yeah, where are you from, Sonny? Hang about. You're a funny-looking soldier with hair like that. Stand up. Come on, you heard me. Turn! Uh, 
I, I'm sick. None of your nonsense now. Who's this you've been keeping with, Thatcher? Well, I'll be down. A woman, no less. Where'd you pick her up? Look, Cap, I'm sorry, Cathy. Look, I think you'd better tell him the truth. No, but it's all right. She's English, so. Shut your mouth, Thatcher. Get yourself down the road to the battery as fast as your big feet will carry you. I'll deal with this. Situation. Yeah, but, Sir, look, you don't understand. Go, look, or look. I'll have you charged with desertion. Please, Eddie, I'll, I'll be all right. Think of yourself. All right. I'll let you, Captain, know just as soon as I can, miss. I swear it. Thank you, Eddie. Well, miss, you could be English, and then again, you might not be. What do you mean by that? The Jellies have been using women spies, and a lot of them talk English like you, all posh-like. No, no, don't sit down. I'm taking you for a walk to Brigade Headquarters, lady. A lot of men are getting killed through women like you. Don't be ridiculous, Sergeant. I'm not a spy. I'm as English as you are. My name is Catherine Webster, and I'm a freelance journalist. I'm on my way to the front to observe and make reports. You got written permission? Well, well, no. Not exactly. You must have come through a dozen or more checkpoints. Where's your pass? Here. See. And but according to this, you're John Webster. I disguised myself as a soldier, as you can see. False document and disguised as a British soldier. To my way of thinking, lady, that makes you a Jerry spy. Why, that's absurd. Absolutely ridiculous. Well, then prove that you're who you say you are. Well, I can't at this moment. I had to leave my proper identification papers back in Paris. How bloody convenient. I bet most of the German spies say the same thing. Now, just you start walking for the door with your hands on the back of your head. I'll be right behind you and make no mistake. One move to run away and I'll shoot you dead. <laughs> Not that it'll make much difference. It's the firing squad for you anyway. Kathy was ignominiously taken to brigade headquarters which was a partly damaged village community hall. There she was locked in a bare room while Sergeant Bailey made his report. Soon after, a stern-looking man entered and conducted her to an office which contained a desk with a chair on either side. The interrogation was harsh, and many of the leading questions were asked by Captain Dalton a dozen times over. You're continually telling lies, young lady. This interrogation can lead to only one conclusion if you persist. Summary execution as a German spy. Do you realize that? Please, you must believe me. Contact my paper in London. The editor, Mr. Aldred, will identify me. We're fighting a war. A vicious, bloody war. Every day, hundreds of men are dying at the front. One more life means nothing. Now, this, this editor chap won't be able to see you, will he? For all we know, there could have been a genuine Catherine Webster. Perhaps she was killed, and you've taken on her identity. It wouldn't be the first time something like that's happened. Now, we don't take the risk of letting you go. It's easier for us to execute you and file a report. That, that's monstrous. It's war, my dear. <laughs> What about Captain Paul Harrison? Or oh, contact him. He'll vouch for me. I'm sorry, but we're not prepared to involve one of our fellow officers in a nasty business like this. It's not a nasty business. Well, you can't just sit there and talk my life away. Well, we'll send to Paris and get my real identification papers for the love of heaven. In the event of them being found, it would prove nothing. They can easily be forged, just as your military pass was. I'm sorry, but you'll have to do better if you want to cheat the firing squad. What can I do? I've told you all I know. As far as I'm concerned, you've told me only what you've been trained to say. Look, uh, there's one way for you to get out of this mess. Tell me the truth. And sign a statement. Tell us who trained you, what part of Germany you come from, and all the military information you can. It could save your life. I can only repeat what I've already told you. As for military information... Good at that, aren't you? But what do you mean by that? We found your notebook. It was brimming over with your observations. That in itself condemns you as a German spy. Oh, my notes! Well, I told you, I'm a newspaper reporter. Where are you going? Obviously, there's nothing more to be said. I shall report to the colonel, and he will decide on the time for your execution. Detail! Sir? Escort the woman back to her room. Shackle her. We can't risk having her escape.
seem is fairly conclusive, Captain Dalton. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind, sir. She is a spy. Mm, what about this Captain Paul Harrison? I've checked, sir. No such officer exists in the uh, tent. I see. Pity, but such a pretty girl, too. Uh, this notebook condemns out of hand. Oh, very well, Captain. I'll sign a warrant for her immediate execution while you organize a firing squad. Oh, cover her head, though. You know how squeamish the men get about shooting a woman. I don't right old time getting to see you, sir, but why should I tell you a lie? Damn it, man, I'm not calling you a liar. It's just so, so astonishing. Cathy, here at the front. I talked to her for hours, sir. I'm, I'm making no mistake. She told me everything. She was taken to brigade headquarters, you say? That's right. Oh, Colonel Radcliffe will be giving her a sharp telling off. Mark my words. I've a good mind to let her sit there and sweat it out until tomorrow. <laughs> She got a nerve coming all this way to write reports for old Aldred, eh? I bet he craftily put her up to it, the old devil. Look, if you ask me, sir, she really came to see you, sir, for Christmas. Silly girl. What kind of Christmas party does she expect to have here? A few snorts and a turkey leg in the officer's mess? <laughs> she wouldn't be allowed in there for a start. Oh, well, I'd better hand over to Captain Rigby for a while, and I'll pop over to headquarters. <laughs> Thought I was in the tenth, did she? Just like a woman to get a man's battalion number, all wrong. Kathy, shocked out of her wits, sat on a wooden bench, feet and hands shackled together by lengths of chain. An army chaplain visited her, but was deaf to her pleas of innocence. Her last visitor was the stern-faced Captain Dalton. Very well, young lady. The time for heroics is over. But you can still save yourself with a confession. If you don't, the execution detail will be coming for you in... in less than a minute from now. Well, have you anything to say? It's a mistake. A terrible, terrible mistake. You're thinking you could spy on us? No. Yes, of course it was. But there are still many pretty fruleins like you who can speak perfect English. Your secret service will use every last one of them. A pity. But it's a dirty war. All wars are. Ah, here they come now. A few seconds ahead of time. Now, please, try not to make a fuss. I'll do my best to make it easy and quick for you. If you stand quite still and make a good target, there's no chance of the men missing. Oh, Colonel. A visitor for your so-called spy, Dalton. Kathy! What a funny way to spend Christmas. <gasps> Paul! Paul, found you. It was both embarrassing, yet a relief to the elderly Colonel Radcliffe. To have shot Cathy would have raised a terrible hullabaloo in a very short time, and he would have been fully responsible. Captain Paul Harrison's positive identification assured her release into his custody. Of course, she would have to be sent back to Paris as soon as possible, so the wily old Colonel, to salve his own conscience, gave Captain Harrison a week's leave in Paris as Cathy's official military escort. It ended well, and Cathy's newspaper reports later caused more storms of controversy, much to my delight. In those few days, she succeeded in establishing a solid professional reputation for herself, and spending that happy Christmas with the man she loved. <laughs> High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.